one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. Dead, buried, cremated. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Treasurer. The Treasurer hurt. knows. Australia is basically done for. We must end up being a third rate economy. You know, a banana republic. How good is Australia? Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast demystifying the big economic issues in Australia and putting them in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Institute, and we're recording this on Wednesday, the 8th of July, 2020. And we're all living through an age of fake news and disinformation, a lot of that centering around politics. In the recent Ed Monero by-election, the Australian Federal Police have arrested and charged a 32-year-old Blacktown man in relation to a campaign of disinformation emails targeting Labor's Ed Monero then-candidate and now member-elect, Chrissy McBain. And no matter which election, there's normally huge amounts of money involved in political advertising. Clive Palmer alone is estimated to have spent around $60 million on political ads in the 2019 federal election. And the major parties, the Liberal and Labor parties, spend upwards of 5 to $10 million on political advertising at each election. While the Morrison government spent an eye-watering $100 million in taxpayer-funded advertising in the lead-up to the 2019 election. So political advertising is big money and big business. And of course, it plays a huge and influential role in Australia's democracy. It's time to move. Yes, it's time. The decision we will make for our country hoists between the past and the future. Working families in Australia have never been better off. Really, Mr Howard? The Australia I want for the future has a strong economy, but one where we don't throw the fair go out the back door. That's the balance that made our country great in the past. To make this country great again. So much waste in Canberra, so many politicians. The next 10 years are important to everybody at every stage of life, the decisions they'll make. And if we get the settings right on our economy and on security. The Greens have a plan to build a future for all of us putting people first and tackling economic inequality. The Liberals and Liberal candidate. I was born in Bega. I've been a farmer, teacher, small businesswoman, army reservist. My parents have always said that a hard day's work equals a fair day's pay and nothing's for granted in this life, so you've got to work hard to achieve whatever it is that you want. And while there are well-established laws that prevent companies lying to customers in their advertising with penalties for misleading and deceptive conduct... What rules govern political advertisements? Well, the fact is, right now, it's perfectly legal to lie in a political ad. So to talk about the need for reforming our political advertising laws, I'm joined by Bill Brown, researcher at the Australia Institute, who recently appeared before the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters on behalf of the Institute. G'day, Bill. Hi, Ebony. So firstly, Bill What's the problem that we're talking about here? What can and can't you do with Australia's current political advertising laws? Broadly, the problem is that you can do almost anything under Australia's current political advertising laws. Bit of a Uh, free-for-all. That's right. Unlike uh, trade and commerce, which is quite strictly regulated, the rules on political advertising are limited to the rare cases So you can't uh, deceive people about the process of voting, for example. Um, But in terms of actually uh, making claims about your opponents or their policies, it's basically a free-for-all. So when you talk about the process of voting, like you can't tell people to vote the day after the election or how to incorrectly, you know, mark your ballot paper, but you can pretty much tell lies about your political opponents without any problems. That's right. Uh, As long as you steer clear of defamation law, there's nothing particular about political advertising that uh, there are no laws particular to political advertising that uh, limit in any way what you can say or do. So can you uh, explain why it's important and why we think um, that there needs to be some reform of those laws? What's at stake here? What's at stake is ultimately the integrity of our electoral process. 
voters are entitled to expect that they make decisions according to the best available information, uh, not that they've been misled when they cast their vote. Uh, it's particularly concerning because we've seen in recent elections growing um, controversy over political ads. Uh, each of the last few federal elections has been marred by serious accusations from one party or the other uh, that there's been misleading advertising that's uh, ultimately reached voters and, and potentially changed their minds. And so what are the kinds of things that the Australia Institute has advocated for? Has the idea of truth in political advertising been regulated anywhere else? Are there any other models that we can emulate? There are models from around the world that Australia should be taking seriously. Uh, the most obvious domestic example is South Australia, which has had truth in political advertising laws since 1985. And we know that those laws work and we know that they're constitutionally sound because they've made it to the Supreme Court of South Australia on exactly that question. Um, so they're a good starting point to prove that uh, truth in political advertising is possible and it can be done here in Australia. And what does that South Australian model look like? Do they basically decide what's truth and what isn't? How do they work? The South Australian model sees complaints made to the Electoral Commission down there. Uh, and the Commission is ultimately responsible for making a decision about whether that complaint is substantiated, in which case they re request a withdrawal or a retraction from the person responsible for the ad. Uh, it usually stops there, although there are provisions for fines of about $5,000 for a person uh, if they've been found responsible for misleading advertising. So I guess part, uh, partly the way that you enforce this would be a system of, of penalties. That's right. Uh, so far, the success in South Australia has mostly been just from the withdrawal and retraction side of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, that alone is enough to achieve a remedy in most cases. Uh, the misinformation is corrected. Uh, people are able to point to their opponents having been caught in this kind of misleading practice, and that's generally enough. However, if you were looking at implementing it nationally, I think you would want to think seriously about whether some kind of financial penalty is worth uh, having as a backup as well. Yeah, because I guess um, the ultimate prize of getting elected to parliament uh, and all the power associated with that uh, is a pretty big incentive compared to perhaps, you know, small fines. So, parties might judge that it's worth the risk. <laughs> That's right. And uh, a retraction one day after an election has absolutely no impact. <laughs> That's right. Um, but Bill, there are, I guess, uh, as you've alluded to, some risks in legislating for truth in political advertising. And you talked about in South Australia that that went all the way um, to the Supreme Court there. Um, what are some of the, the risks or the problems that a parliament might face in legislating for truth in political advertising? The federal parliament has legislated for truth in political advertising a couple of times already, mm -hmm. um, and both times it's walked that back. Uh, the second time in 1991, it was actually found to be unconstitutional. In that case, they went quite a bit beyond the South Australian model with very strict limitations on advertising uh, that went beyond just addressing the misleading angle. Um, and is there much support for truth in political advertising laws? We see broad support from Australians. We've been asking Australians whether they support such laws for about four years now. And we consistently get well over 80% of people supporting such laws. And uh, in the last poll we did earlier this year, it was as high as 89% in support. Uh, so the general public are strongly supportive of laws like this. And you can see why when you see how disappointed people are in, uh, in the misleading advertising that we've seen in the past. And what about other types of support? So I know the Australia Institute recently coordinated an open letter that was signed by several prominent Australians. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. 
So the Australia Institute uh, released an open letter from 29 prominent Australians earlier this year in conjunction with our appearance before the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, to emphasise that there are prominent Australians who are prepared to give their backing to such a proposal. Uh, This included support from former politicians like Cheryl Curnow and John Hewson, uh, as well as former judges and uh, other members, other prominent Australians. And I guess uh, looking at that letter, the the call was really to pass truth in political advertising laws that are nationally consistent, constitutional, and that uphold freedom of speech. And are those really the key elements that we're looking for here? That's right. I think it is important when you're talking about political speech to make sure that freedom of speech is one of the principal objectives. Uh, Having said that, uh, there's no right to mislead or deceive people. Uh, So finding the balance there is part of why uh, I'd like to see the parliament taking on this issue and really exploring in depth what can be done. And so, Bill, when we look at, obviously, we've got the example of South Australia, but are any other parliaments, state or federally, looking at doing anything on political advertising? Uh, Just last week, the Australian Capital Territory saw an announced plan for amendments to their Electoral Act, which would implement truth in political advertising on similar lines to what we already have in South Australia. Uh, That was proposed by Caroline Lacuda for the ACT Greens. Uh, And it'll be exciting to see uh, what the ACT Legislative Assembly makes of that in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, we certainly know the ACT is progressive, very progressive on a number of, um, of other fronts. So that'll be an interesting debate to watch. Definitely. Uh, one of the interesting questions is how, who is responsible for overseeing truth in political advertising? In South Australia, they use the Electoral Commission uh, of South Australia, but of course, the Australian Electoral Commission is a, a trusted and independent agency that could be relied upon for national truth in political advertising laws. Um, but there are other creative options that have been suggested, like using the ACCC. Uh, since they're already used to considering issues of truth in commercial advertising, uh, they'd have a lot of the expertise and willingness, I think, to take on issues like this. Uh, There's also been proposals to make use of the knowledge and experience of former politicians, academics, journalists, and so on, uh, who could perhaps advise on, uh, based on their experience and practical understanding, what uh, crosses the line into untruthfulness. Thanks, Bill. We might wrap it up there. Thanks a lot. This has been a special episode of Follow the Money, and we're aiming to bring you shorter but more frequent episodes during the pandemic, so please stay tuned. You can check out the Australia Institute's Economics of a Pandemic webinar series at our website, tai.org.au forward slash webinars. And our next event is on Wednesday, the 15th of July at 11am with Professor Megan Davis, Jamie Lowe and Michael Mansell, Uh, in conversation with Richard Dennis talking about treaty and sovereignty as part of the National Treaties Summit. It's free, but registration is essential, so head to our website to register. For the latest health information, you can check health.gov.au or listen to the ABC's excellent Coronacast podcast, which comes out daily. You can visit tai.org.au for all our latest research and content, including Bill's research on truth in political advertising. We're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS, and my Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. This episode was produced by Jennifer Macy with help from Grace Crivellero and Lucy Law. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum. And please stay safe, stay one and a half metres away and keep washing those hands. Thanks for listening. Thank you.